introducing Freddy Silva. He is a best-selling author, leading researcher of ancient civilizations, restricted history, sacred sites, and the interaction with consciousness. He is also a leading expert on crop circles. Freddy has published six books in six languages. For two decades, he has been an international keynote speaker with notable appearances on the International Science and Consciousness Conference, International Society for the Study of Subtle Energies and Energy Medicine, and the Association for Research and Enlightenment, in addition to appearances on Gaia TV, History Channel, and BBC. Freddie is a documentary filmmaker, art photographer, and leads private tours to sacred sites in England, France, Egypt, Portugal, Yucatan, Malta, Peru, Bolivia, and Scotland. How's it going, Freddie? I need to get that down to five words or less. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can't explain everything that you do. Great to see you, brother. How are you? Oh, not too bad. Uh, waiting for the sunshine to pop through. I think the whole of uh, America is having a drought, except for Maine. We got everybody, the, the whole continent's water here. Uh, mm. Please come and get some. We're tired of it. <laughs> well, Freddie, I want to introduce you to Ariel. She's um, co-produced this event with me, and she's really fond of your work. Ariel, how are you? Freddie, it's, it's just a pleasure to meet you. And that is true. I have watched your work from afar, so I'm excited to say hello and have a front row seat today. Mm -hmm. All right. It's all well, yours, brother. Let's see if I can make this work. Because uh, I need to share the screen. And hello, everybody, wherever you are. Um, and maybe if I get this right, I should be able to do this. And does that work? Share. Yeah, it worked. Yeah, we can ah, see it. Voila. Excellent. Right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, right. It's always weird getting your head in the state because we're running a little bit behind. So I'm just going to get myself back into this. Um, I want to share something that's a bit unusual, uh, of course. Uh, a story that took place about 12,000 years ago, which is as, uh, as relevant as anything uh, that you can imagine. Uh, but it's also a story that very few people are aware of. Now, one of the uh, things that I learned about having uh, living in a place that's very cold in the winter is that if you go to the southern hemisphere in the winter, you get summer. So you end up with summer twice. And one of my favorite places of all in the uh, world is New Zealand. And I had no idea how rich the history of that country is because it doesn't just start with the arrival of the Maori about ooh, eight centuries ago. It actually starts way before that. And uh, I sort of came across the, uh, the story, which is uh, it's a highly political, a bit of a political landmine down there uh, for all kinds of reasons, which I won't go into. But I discovered the story about another people that no one's ever heard of, and I'm fascinated by them, and I'm totally in awe. So I'm going to share this today with you, because it touches on so many things about uh, the ancient past, about the gods and the other things that we keep talking about, and the megalithic cultures that we've inherited, and no one seems to know how these things connect. And one of the things that I, I guess I specialize in is connecting things, connecting dots. So... I want to kind of also demonstrate how people, you know, our ancestors were actually getting around on a global scale much more than we've given them credit for. Uh, they were using the oceans, essentially. They were master seafarers. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey uh, to New Zealand and the Pacific and also a little bit around the world to give you an idea of what this story is about. And if this works, no, no it doesn't. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, there we go. That's how it worked. Uh, let's go over to this place called Waitangi Kerado, uh, otherwise known to you and me as Easter Island. Now, few have heard of the Waitaha, who are Easter Island's indigenous people, or even less, they've uh, heard of their oral tradition. Now, the uh, oral traditions of these people uh, were published about, I just want to say about 25 years ago. So it's quite a, a new thing for this to be on paper. And um, they, uh, the thing that really uh, amazed me about their story is that they were describing how they lived on Easter Island, and I quote, when the stars shone in a different sky and a different pattern. So in other words, because of the way the Earth and the horizon connect to each other, 
every few hundred years, the position of the stars and the sun start to move, which means that by the time you've gone over 4,000 years, the position of the sky is in a completely different location. So they're talking about a very, very different time when they lived here. And also because they describe Easter Island as the lands, plural, and outer islands of Waitangi Kiraro. In other words, they remember a time when this island was an archipelago. And the last time that happened was over 12,000 years ago. And you can't make this stuff up unless you really understand geology and climatology, which these people are not privy to the latest satellite information. And uh, the story kind of talks about a time when the Waitaha welcomed the appearance of the double hull canoe of the gods. And these gods were called the Urukeu, and they are described as star walkers and long distance voyagers who traveled regularly across the Pacific. Now, remember, this is 12,000 years ago. And the Waitaha talk about a time when one year the canoe of the gods failed to return when, I quote, angry stars gathered close to the moon to give birth to the tides of chaos. The dreaded... Freddie, if I could interject really quick, your volume's a little bit low. We can hear you, but it's not high enough. Any way to turn oh, it up? This is the best I can do. How about that? I think it went up a bit. If I can get some feedback in the room, is that okay? Because I've got a professional mic here. Well, actually, okay, so if you go to the microphone in Zoom, you can turn it up through Zoom, make it a little louder. So cool. let's stop your screen share, and just we'll take one minute here just to make sure we get a good sound quality. Look at the microphone at the bottom left. Right next to it, there's an arrow. You click uh, audio settings, and then you turn your microphone up. Audio settings. So right next to the mute icon, ah. there is an arrow that faces up. Ah. Okay. Ah, there we go. Excellent. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, oh, we have to go back to this again then. Hang on. Share. Yeah. There we go. Rock and roll. Um, so one year, the story goes, the canoe failed to return when angry stars gathered close to the moon to give birth to the tides of chaos, the dreaded deluge. So it immediately puts the account at around 10,000 BC, which is pretty much close to the boundary of uh, the Younger Dryas, which is the period when we now know that the, uh, the Great Flood took place. And uh, the actual date is about 9,703 BC, give or take a day or two. So my question in, in all of this was, where were the Yurukeu headed to? Well, they were headed, if I can get this to work, to New Zealand. And uh, they were literally following the curves of the currents. They were complete, uh, had complete mastery of the knowledge of how the currents works. And um, two generations after the world turned by water, which is the way they describe the Great Flood, a descendant of these gods, the Urukeu, uh, just for a change, a female by the name of Hotu Matua arrives on Easter Island after the flood consumed her homeland. In other words, the sea level rose and she lost her island homeland in the middle of the Pacific. And she arrives on uh, Easter Island with seven sages and she was in charge of remapping the Pacific and its missing lands, all of which of course have now become islands. So, so far, all this is absolutely on par with the changes that took place at the time of the flood. Oh, hang on. This is all very difficult. Here we go. So the Urukeu, uh, they said, were described as very tall. They were light skinned, which is unusual in the Pacific. And they had red hair with green eyes. And sometimes they were blonde with blue eyes. And also they all had beards, uh, which in South America, by the way, in many Pacific islands, men are genetically incapable of having beards. So these people look very, very different to Polynesians. They came from somewhere else. And if you look at the picture on the left, look at the Moai. He has this wonderful uh, image of a beard. In fact, it's more like a, a, a sort of a goatee, very, very hip. Uh, you can just see it in the oldest Moai with, the, with their extended chins, which also defines uh, a beard. And um, literally, they were, these people, the Uruke were, were, literally means the red people, uh, whether it was red skin, red head, we don't know. But if you look at the uh, hats that the Moai have, and many people have asked this, why do they have these red hats? 
uh, because they are made of a completely different material to the uh, stone that they that carved the Moai from. It would have saved them a lot of time just to carve the whole thing in one go, but no, they took it upon themselves to carve the oldest Moai from basalt, which is not exactly an easy rock to work with. And then they added these hats, which are made of red scoria. Well, according to the white harder said they did this because it had to de depict their hair color. Uh, so now we know we have it from the people who actually lived on Easter Island, this mysterious source of these mysterious red hats. But uh, although the White Aha account is over 11,000 years old, uh, they don't actually mention erecting the Moai at all. It's already an established fact on the island. So if it was, uh, and there's plenty of Moai on the island, so you'd think that something as momentous as this would have been written down or recorded, and yet it is matter of fact. And I've had conversations with Robert Schock, the geologist, and that we're both of the uh, opinion that the level of sediment to which these things are buried cannot account for 800 years of people living on Easter Island, which is the uh, usual academic argument that, that these things were put up during historic times. No, the White Aha tradition completely contradicts this. And what we're looking at here with the sediment is thousands of years of sediment and erosion. So this is about to change the whole course of history, uh, listening to this story. So let me move this forward a little bit. So after the world was turned by water, the grandchildren of the gods set sail from Easter Island back to New Zealand to locate a place called the birthplace of the gods. Oh, wouldn't you just love to go uh, to a place called the birthplace of the gods? Uh, I have, I've been there six times. I can't get enough of it. It's one of the most extraordinary, extraordinary landscape temples on earth. In fact, here you'll find three incredible landscape temples, which were described by the Dalai Lama himself as a spiritual center of the universe, not the earth, the universe. So it makes you wonder what the Dalai Lama also knows about this place. And here it is. Uh, I've taken a photograph standing on one of the sites, looking across the valley to the central site, and it's called the Sacred Nest, Tekohanga. And it literally means the crucible of the world in Maori. And uh, once upon a time, it was surrounded by a lake when the region was much wetter and uh, full of glaciers, uh, of course, much drier today because of global warming. Uh, so the whole uh, sort of section that you're looking at here resembled a kind of primordial island, kind of a, a pregnant belly from which life is created, like so many sites around the world. And if you happen to go there, which is a good three hour hike, uh, which I've done by the way, um, you look back across to the second site from where I'm taking the photograph and here it is. It's the stones on that ridge that we're concerned with here because that is Kura Tauhiti. And it literally translates in Maori as the distant school. And uh, each of those stones that you see up on the plateau is said to hold the wisdom of the Urukeu in the stones itself. Let me give you a little close up here. There we go, just to give you a bit of size. And these things were said to have been carved into the stones by the wisdom keepers, the keepers of stone. And apparently, and this is to quote the White Aha directly, these people were able to shape stone without breaking its spirit. Oh, what a great quote. And uh, the first time I came here, I didn't know about this story. I just went there with a friend of mine. And uh, the first thing I said when I looked at these stones was these are not naturally eroded monuments because there are places on earth, if they're made of a certain geology, that the water will erode stones in a certain way to make them look like the features of animals or faces or people and so forth. That is, that is something called simulacra. It's a natural phenomenon. But yet, I mean, and I'm a sort of an amateur geologist in my own right, and I could tell you that this was not natural. There was something about this place that looked very man-made. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And sure enough, when I finally got to hear about the White Raha tradition and read about it, they actually talk about it. And they said, and I quote, huge are the sacred monuments that we carved at Tekohanga. So now we know uh, these things are actually the eroded versions of the spirits of the place into which they poured their wisdom. And their most prominent monument is actually on top of the ridge. It's the two three goddess of the site, and she is called Marotini. In fact, let me tell you what they said about her. A towering column of the purest stone was shaped to place Marotini in the land. 
We ask so much of the stone shapers when they carved her to stand against the stars. Tall timbers and thick ropes lifted them high above the land to carve Marotini. Ever higher they climbed to cut away the curving charcoal lines to reveal the beauty of our ancestors. So if you look very carefully at this eroded rock, it's been there for quite a while, you can just see a little bit of the mauls that they used to, to take out the, uh, the, the charcoal and literally pound away this enormous uh, monolith, uh, which still looks a, bit, a bit like a sphinx if you, uh, in a certain light. And um, so at this point, my, my curiosity was really aroused because I now I'm thinking, well, when might the birthplace of the gods been established? Because if the Urukeu were navigating the Pacific before the flood, they could have been in New Zealand before 10,000 BC. Now, nothing was written down in terms of timing in these ages, a bit like the Aboriginal people, everything, time is a bit of a fluid uh, event in the stories of these indigenous people. But the Waitaha in the second book do describe a calendar stone in this valley. And I figured, well, if we could find the calendar stone, it could help validate the landscape temple because there's an ancient system whereby the ancient monuments on the face of the earth all memorialize the date when they were built by aligning themselves to a specific star. The problem is you've got to find the alignment and you've got to find the star that they're looking at, which means a hell of a lot of work for Mr. Research here. So I decided to go walk about to the third site after five years of looking at these monoliths. And I went to another site on the other side of the valley and years of searching, nothing resembled a calendar stone. And it was at this uh, third site, which is, it must have over 10,000 uh, monoliths all over the place. And most of them are natural without a shade of a doubt. But there was one of them that just stood out and the only damn bird in the entire valley happens to stand on this thing. And it was actually a falcon of all things. So if I was a visiting Egyptian, I would have thought the god Horus is trying to give me a clue here. So I, I walked all the way over to the stone. And again, you got to realize that you're high up on a mountain and this has been eroded. And uh, I thought water does not do this to, to rocks. This is very, very unusual. So I got close up and this is what it looks like. It actually looks like a sundial with a little nobule sticking out, which still looks like it has the two eyes and the nose looking up at the sky. And again, it's maybe just been natural erosion, but I cannot account for that disc. That is something very, very unnatural. And across the valley, there you see Kudatauhiti, I want to say about five, six miles away, the, the distant school of the Maori. So at this point, I'm taking alignments and I'm going, well, what am I looking for? Because I've got the alignments, I've got the angles, but what am I looking for in the sky? Well, a bit more research. The principal constellations of the Waitaha mythology are Orion and the Southern Cross. So I figured, let's start there and figure out what we can do. Well, using the art of archaeoastronomy, we now have the ability using computer aided uh, applications to roll back the sky and find out what was having, happening in the sky 10,000 years ago, which is ex exactly what I did. So rolling all this way back, the first sighting of the Southern Cross above that stone took place exactly on the spring equinox in 14,800 BC. And there you see the Milky Way also walking vertically up uh, over the the, uh, the rock. So this is a momentous occasion. And if it's correct, uh, then the Urukeu were here before the start of the three ice ages, which is what uh, they call them the uh, oldest, the old and the younger dryas. So this is also a very memorable occasion in geological circles as well. Now, if you happen to be ultra skeptical and you think perhaps we're pushing the envelope a little bit too far here in New Zealand, well, absolutely, uh, that's it's certainly worth thinking about. So I figured let's look at Orion. So I took a look, uh, I took a bead on Orion and see what we could do here. And sure enough, if we follow this, you be -dee -be -dee -be -dee, the first time that you see the um, uh, the whole, uh, the constellation of the belt of Orion is, sorry, uh, start again. The first time you actually see the uh, belt of Orion is just above 
the, uh, the stone in 10,800 BC. I think I might have got a, 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 an actual picture ahead. Um, you only saw the belt of Orion rising above the uh, mountains and the stone for the first time in 10,800 BC in the spring equinox. So the funny thing is, that's exactly the date when the first meteorite impacts occurred that began the last ice age. But now, when do you get to see the whole constellation, which is this picture that you're seeing right here? Well, the first time that the entire constellation is seen above the stone is on the spring equinox of 10,400 BC. Now, that is also quite important because uh, we have here something that is very pronounced. I'm trying to try to work two things here at the same time. Let's see if I can get this correct. So at the same time that we see, if you're standing here looking at this interaction on this side, if you happen to also have a person on the other part of the valley, which is Manotini, the goddess, at the same moment that that alignment is taking place at the calendar stone, we are seeing this. We are seeing the Southern Cross rising above and facing the uh, goddess of the site. Now that is a dual uh, uh, referenced on two different parts of the, uh, the valley, giving us a high probability that the Urukeo were commemorating this date at the birthplace of the gods. Now, those of you who are very attentive will recognize where have we seen the sky ground date correlation before? Well, absolutely. Teotihuacan, uh, the three pyramids, uh, main pyramids mirror the belt of Orion on this exactly the same date. And of course, your friend and my friend, the Giza um, alignments as well. Um, the, three uh, the three pyramids of Giza mirror, mirror the belt of Orion exactly the same date. And if you happen to go downstream to another temple, uh, which is called the Osirian, you would have also found this same um, uh, uh, date connection as well. In fact, it's a little bit uh, older than the pyramids, because if you're standing here, um, around about the same date, you would have been in the Osirian at Abydos, looking up at the sky. And uh, in fact, you actually you wouldn't have been, because the, this would have had a ceiling. And uh, this was a freestanding temple uh, on the Nile back then, uh, not as it is today. Uh, back then, the Osirian was a building on the Nile Plateau. The, the water used to come right up to it. And you would have been able to look outside the door and you would have seen uh, on the winter solstice and the spring equinox in 10,500 BC, just a little bit before the pyramids, the uh, star, uh, sorry, the constellation of Cygnus rising vertically in front of the doorway with the bright star Deneb framed by the doorway rising right along the Milky Way, like a big conveyor belt going up to the pole. It would have been a very, very dramatic moment. And uh, there is a big connection here between this momentous occasion and the Urukeu, because the building texts commemorate this particular moment in time in Egypt as the first occasion. And there's a similar date downstream as well. Uh, let's see. Doo -ba -doo -ba -doo. Technology is not my strong point here. <laughs> uh, this is the moment when the gods who of Egypt arrive uh, at, in the Nile, and they were called the Aku Shemsu Hor. And it literally translates as the shining ones, the followers of Horus. And just like the Urukeyu in New Zealand, they also arrived in groups of seven plus one. So there were seven gods with one charismatic leader. So they're already here around 10,800 BC, just like the first date in the site in New Zealand. So there's a correlation going on here between the gods of New Zealand and, the, uh, and Egypt. They're both arriving at these locations exactly at the same time. But the Edfu texts, which are the texts which are here at this temple in, uh, in Egypt, they give us a little bit more information. They talk about the, the fact that these gods arrived in Egypt after the partial destruction of the homeland when they established their presence on the Nile. Now, a lot of people will say, okay, it's just mythology. Yes, it is. Except that mythology is a wonderful method by which to tell you important historical information in a way you won't forget. That's why it always seems a little bit weird for us in our particular time. 
It also happens to coincide with some archaeological evidence that in the Nile Valley, where an agricultural revolution, which cannot be explained under normal circumstances, takes place in 10,500 BC, literally within a few hundred years of these people arriving in the Nile. So now we know that the myth is absolutely correct. They're trying to tell you a very important piece of information. And the, um, <laughs> here we go. Boom. Um, these gods in Egypt are described as seafaring astronomers. They're light-skinned, they're very tall, and they also have red hair, which uh, anybody that was visiting here from Easter Island and, and New Zealand would say, well, wait a minute. You're plagiarizing the description of our gods because that's how we describe them as well. So perhaps they are one and the same people, I would suggest, because um, both of their leaders uh, held the same title of office, would you believe? So we're, you know, we're on opposite sides of the world, and yet you have the two main uh, people who were guiding these gods that had the same title, and the title was the net of the world. And they were given this title for their ability to map the rearranged lands after the flood. And here is a panel on the wall of the temple of Edfu that depicts the gods as the net of the world. Well, how is it that these two stories on two of the sides of the world are shared here in Egypt? So the other thing that connects these two different gods is that both of these people were also intimately associated with Orion, the constellation. You can't make this stuff up, and if you could, my job would be a lot easier. Now, let's return to the Waitaha narrative for a second. Back, where we go, to the Pacific. Well, when the Urukei returned from New Zealand, uh, they would have to bypass Easter Island because of the way the currents worked. And they had to go to the place of the ancestors, which was called the Great Land in the East, where they were already established. Now, uh, unless there's a missing land somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, the only other big land I know in the East is South America. And um, it was a bit of speculation at the time, except uh, when I began to read it into the grandmother's story of the Waitaha, they gave us a huge clue. And they said that when the gods traveled to the big land in the east, they took two totem birds with them to give them good luck. And one bird was called Titi and the other one was called Kaka, which together, of course, makes the sound Titi Kaka, uh, of the big lake in the middle of the Andes. And as it turns out, this is backed by the building text at Edfu that mentioned the origin of the followers of Horus as being on an island called Iu Titi, the island of ancestors. So now we have the grandmothers of the Waitaha being completely backed up by the stories of the Egyptians. So if you haven't been there, this uh, to, um, uh, Titicaca is the home of the beautiful temple city of Tiwanaku. And here it is. This is, a, this is the sun gate. Beautiful uh, piece of uh, carving, uh, which you could do an entire lecture just on that head uh, piece, by the way. It's an incredibly complex mathematical um, computerization of the sky, which I will not get, uh, get into right now. Now, I'm very big on the origin of names because the origin of names tells you a lot about what was going on there in the ancient past because uh, the names were given as attributes to what was taking place at these sites. The trick is you've got to learn dead languages to understand what these things mean. So the etymology of Tiwanaku reveals information about its origin and purpose. So Aymara is the local language. It's one of the oldest languages in the world. It's almost a dead language. There's only about 3,000 people that speak it. But once I got uh, sort of um, hold of it, it uh, Tiwanaku has two words, and it means my people. Now, my guide, who is an Aymara gentleman, lovely man, I said to him, you know, but it's funny, but Aku, cool. um, that's actually a word that I know very well. And he says, well, actually, it's not really an Aymara word, to which I said, well, no, it's not. That actually happens to be an Egyptian word, and it means the shining beings. So in other words, Te Wan Aku literally translates as the city of shining people. Oh, this now means that we have an overlap here with two different cultures. 
But the question again is, how old could this place possibly be? Let's take a look. This is a photograph that was taken around 1900 and it shows a massive quadrangle of stones which calculates the skies. And it literally is very, very, very big. And it's called the Kalasasaya. And the excavation of the Kalasasaya at Tiwanaku revealed the monoliths to be offset from the horizon by 18 degrees. And as I said earlier, because of the way the earth works relative to the sky, over thousands of years, the two stop aligning to each other. So when we start looking at the alignment of these stones relative to the horizon, they don't match anymore because everything has moved position. So the gentleman uh, who uh, took it upon himself to spend 40 years at this site, Arthur Poznanski, he calculated mathematically the positioning of the stones relative to the horizon when they would have matched specific stars the sun and the moon. And he came up with a very specific correlation in 15,000 BC, which is pretty much the same date as the early date of the birthplace of the gods in New Zealand. So this is getting a little bit juicy. So even so, as old as this is, the Kalasasaya appears to have been forced to fit an existing layout. Because if you take a look at the adjacent sites, they're all slanted by three degrees. Uh, if you've been here, you would have been to the semi-subterranean temple, which is actually is not semi-subterranean at all. It used to be a freestanding temple. It's just been covered by the uh, water from Titicaca, which is now 20 miles away. And also Puma Punku next door and the Akapama pyramid, all of these are founded on deeper sediment and they're much, much older. So these sites reference the earth and its meridian in an even earlier era. Now, figure this out. It takes the earth and its axis to, um, let's see, it takes its axis 21,600 years to move three degrees, which means it places the earliest temples at Tiwanaku in 36,000 BC. Now, is this too old for a civilization up in the highest Andes at 12 and a half thousand feet altitude? Well, let's take into consideration the Egyptian king list, which is written in the Turin Papyrus, which uh, makes a wonderful observation that there were three periods of gods in Egypt and elsewhere, and they begin around up between 39,000 and 36,000 BC. It's something that archaeologists do not want to talk about because it's very inconvenient. So we have a correlation here in terms of, uh, in terms of dates. So the observation shows that there are three building periods taking place here in Tiwanaku. There's a very remote period. There's a rebuilding in about 15,000 BC, which is about the time when uh, the first ice age uh, hit, which is a time of severe catastrophic uh, events in the face of the earth. And then a rebuilding period after the great flood. And this is very, very consistent with geology. Well, now the question is, was it the Urukeu who returned to Lake Titicaca to rebuild the sites, I wonder? Well, let's have a look. In the Aymara and Pukina traditions of the area, they say that they fled to the Andes when the flood sank their island continent, which they called Lapukije. And they also call it by another word, Mu'ul, which is where the word Lemuria comes from. And they still talk about it today as if it was yesterday. And they talk about how the temples were rebuilt by a god-man called Vidakosha, along with seven craftspeople. And they were called the Haihaiwapanti. And when you asked them, well, what does this mean in Ayamara? And they said, well, it means the shining people, exactly the same as the Egyptian gods. And if you look very carefully at this carving of Vidakosha, again, in red stone, same one as on Easter Island, you'll see on the side there, he has the serpent emblem on his side. That's the symbol of office for all the gods around the world. They were called the people of the serpent because anyone who had control of the laws of nature and understood the laws of the cosmos, which of course is electricity and magnetism, which flow like serpents, invisible serpents, that's why they were given the name people of the serpent. Nothing to do with reptilians like they talk about on ancient aliens is to do with the fact that they had control of electromagnetism. They control the, the laws of nature. Well, what else do we know about these interesting people? Well, the Haiwaiwa Panti was said to be very tall, 
light skinned with red hair and with beards, which in the Andes, men are genetically incapable of having beards. So they're a progeny of these, of these gods, even though they're much shorter than they are today. So by comparison, uh, I'm actually considered the god in the Andes because I'm six foot five. And by the way, we're, we're going to do a little tour of this area in about six weeks. We have three seats left, so get your skates on. All right, promotion over. Now look at the elongated skulls. Uh, this is, has nothing to do with head biting. These are natural occurring skulls because they are 25% larger cranial capacity than human skulls. This is not possible to achieve by artificially induced cranial deformation. You can change the shape of a skull by binding it, uh, the skull when you're a young lad, but you cannot increase the size of the skull. So what you're looking at here is a natural DNA, sorry, a natural genetic deformation of the skulls, a completely different group of people. And the DNA from these people tracks to a region of the Black Sea, to Mesopotamia, and also Egypt. So remember this, because this, this is very, very important. These people came from very far away. So this now means that Vidakosha and his Hywapanti, who also, by the way, were associated with Orion, formally links these three good uh, groups of people. So in my mind, we are dealing here with the same group of people around the world who are literally called by different names, but they behave very differently and they look the same. So now the question is, could they possibly have been also active, let's say in Central America? Well, let's go and find out. I'm sorry, they didn't have uh, uh, cameras back then, so we'll have to do with illustrations. Well, the flood gods in Central America, and specifically around the Yucatan, were called the Chak Zai Unkob. And I'm sorry that there's any Maya people here because I may be torturing and butchering your language. Uh, but in English, they literally translate to red ant men. Why? Well, because they labored to create order in nature, just as industrious red ants tend to do. However, the metaphor also described the relationship between these gods and the three stars of Orion's belt, which actually do resemble the tripartite body of an ant. So it's very observant of them. And their leaders, okay, were people that you know quite well. One of them is Quetzalcoatl, and the other one is Kukulkan, and the third one, which you may not know so well, and perhaps the most important of them all, is Itzamna. And he's the one who gave his name to Chichen Itza, uh, which is much older than you think. Uh, the pyramids that you see here is actually five pyramids, excuse me, inside another one. Uh, these things go back much, much older than uh, we're told in uh, uh, normal history. Surprise, surprise. And it may come as no surprise by now that he, these three groups of gods also arrive on the coast of Yucatan with seven people, all masters of their craft. And their nickname, the Kanu, literally translates as the people of the serpent. And apparently they arrived on serpent rafts. Now, this is not because they were really clever and they put themselves in a boat full of snakes in order to ride the Atlantic in order to get away from a big flood. No, nobody's that stupid. Uh, literally the raft full of serpents meant that the people inside the, the, the uh, canoe were the serpent people. That's what the metaphor is trying to tell you. And the funny thing is, is that um, this story is not uh, unique to Central America or the, um, the Maya, because the Hopi also knew about the Red Ant people, and they form part of Hopi tradition. And they, they call them the Anu Na Ki, which literally translates as Ant Father Home. In other words, they're an ancestral people linked to the homeland of the Hopi. That's what the name really implies. And here you see them uh, beautifully painted on the wall of Horseshoe Canyon. Uh, is it Horseshoe Canyon? I believe it is in Utah, which believe me, it's one of the best hikes you will ever do. Five hours at four in the morning and take five gallons of water in your backpack because you will need it. And you'll be rewarded with this beautiful painting on the walls of seven uh, of these people, plus the one leader who of course stands out above all the others. And they are actually depicted life-size. They are over eight feet tall. That's how tall they were. So the leader of these people, which is the guy with the big eyes, 
His name was Anu Sinom, which literally translates as the ant person. And the hope he described him as unusual, uh, actually describes the, he and the other people as unusual humanoids, generous and hardworking, who helped the people survive the Younger Dryas flood and reach the safety of the American Southwest, where he, uh, Anu Sinom, lends his name to the first people who live there, who are called the Hisat Sinom. And I hope you're paying attention to this because they eventually become known as the Anasazi and perhaps the Anusazi, because the name is actually translatable as well. So again, if you look very closely at the picture on your right, you see that serpent motif, that badge of office. They too were the people of the serpent. Now, if you're still paying attention, earlier I mentioned the DNA of the gods of the Andes as originating in Egypt, and specifically the Black Sea and Mesopotamian regions, which back then were pretty much close to each other. There was no real distinction. I mean, 400 miles is nothing between friends. And in the region of the gods that follow the same physical description are the people called the Anu. And they are described, again, as unusually tall, light-skinned. <laughs> you begin to get the drift by now, I think. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they're also, they're, they're light, the reason why they had light skin is because they came from somewhere else. And they had a problem with this light skin, just like we, you know, white people tend to have when we go under the sun. We have to put some suntan lotion on. Well, it turns out, if you read the oldest traditions uh, written by a sage called Emed Ur Anu, who then gets retranslated in the Hebrew text as Enoch, and the story has been highly politicized, so you have to read the Sumerian version of this. Um, he talked about how these Anu people had to anoint their skin with a certain oil, and he gave the skin a shining appearance. And this is where they gained the nickname, the Shining Ones. But there was a double uh, metaphor going on here because it wasn't just because the skin was shiny, it was also because it defined their status as enlightened people. Because when you are enlightened and learned, there's a certain glow about you and that's what makes you shine amongst your peers. So we, keep, we bear this in mind. And here they are again, because these Lords of Anu also oversaw seven groups of seven Lords. And these people were referred to as the Apkalu, which in Sumerian translates as a sage, a master of the craft. So these are people who are really understood and uh, certain features that they were masters of uh, architecture or energy or healing uh, or how to work with plants and so forth. They really took upon themselves to learn something very, very unique that then they could teach others how to make a better life of themselves. And um, the nickname that they went by was the Watchers. And um, the watchers uh, literally translates as those who watch, uh, those who are basically are mediators between the gods and ordinary humans. And in fact, they're almost like messengers, they're go-betweens. And uh, if anybody's really familiar with this story, especially from the Bible, you know that the watchers are given very short shrift. And this is because in the Hebrew and Jewish traditions, they had to be demonized in order to elevate the God of the Hebrews, uh, Yahweh to the highest position uh, in the sky. So everybody else had to come down before Yahweh. So these people are all demonized, they're satanic, they kill people, they eat human beings, and it's absolute nonsense. You have to look at this beyond the political implications of the period uh, in which it took place in, which is the Babylonian period, because the Babylonians were saying exactly the same thing. These people have stolen our stories and they've turned them upside down to make their God look better than ours. You know, just like anybody does around the world. This is nothing new. Uh, but if you look back at the original story, these people were actually great helpers and of, of society and also of humanity. And it's acknowledged by such by indigenous cultures, such as the Hopi. And this is why uh, when you find these figurines called the Mezari placed at the corners of sacred buildings in Mesopotamia to protect the buildings against evil, it demonstrates that if these figurines, which are essentially uh, depictions of the watchers, well, they can't obviously be male malevolent if they're protecting the building from harm. It doesn't make any sense. 
So the Mezari translates as watchers, awakened ones. And the metaphor implies that these people literally were both guardians and enlightened people. So not very demonic at all. So the, the watchers and the lords of Anu were distinguishable from humans insofar as they possessed knowledge of the mechanics of nature and how to manipulate it in a good way. And that's why they were compared to gods. And it's a view that is also held up by the Egyptians because they refer to these people as Ushu, which means watchers, and Neter, which means a force of nature, a god because that's all a god was back then. If you understand the law of nature and you can master it, you become as a god. Anyone, including me, can do this and become as a god. That's what it all meant. It wasn't a white guy sitting on a throne with a beard, throwing thunderclaps and lightning balls at you if you were a sinner. That's a very, very different story altogether. So if we sort of Try and put, uh, bring all these things together because I'm condensing a huge story here and I have a map here for you. Um, these people were one and the same international group of sages, of craftspeople, of masters of the natural arts. And they were described as human-like, yet not quite human because humans, uh, hunter-gatherers were very comfortable living next to them. They were just very tall, very unusual, light-skinned, red-haired, blonde people. Uh, what we come to in term today as uh, Scandinavian, by the way, uh, but they were very comfortable with them and they formed the basis of the godlike people of their stories. And the fact is, you know, why did it take so long to recognize all these connections? Well, because they were called by different names around the world, except the names were actually descriptions of titles. They were not actually just names. They describe what they mean. And it is these titles, along with their attributes, that link them all together. So the red people, the shining people, the shining ones, the people of the serpent, the lords of Anu, they are one and the same worshippers of nature who became godlike. And their point of origin is somewhat of a mystery, although Orion comes up repeatedly in every indigenous tradition that I have researched. So as to their terrestrial origin, uh, to keep things on the ground a little bit, I want to go back to Easter Island because there is a platform there, one of the oldest platforms there called Ahu Hanunaku. And yes, you're absolutely right. It, it is named after the group of tall, light-skinned, red-haired people called the Anunnaki, or the Anunnaga, as they were called in India, the people of the serpent. And the Ahu, is, the name is derivative of the Egyptian word Aku, as in Aku Shemsu Hor, which means shining ones, followers of Horus. Now, what is what is Egyptian language doing here on Easter Island? Well, you may ask the same thing of Fiji because their main island, Ra'iatea, literally means the light-skinned people of Ra. That is a Polynesian island and it's named after a whole bunch of Egyptian words. So these people were getting around the Pacific very comfortably, you know, as easily as you and I go shopping for a can of baked beans. It was not difficult for them back then. And the uh, tradition of the Cook Islands, one of the, sh the smallest places in the Pacific, in fact, I'll have to give you a map because it's so hard to find on the face of the earth uh, that I have to circle it. Um, one specific island called uh, Tongareva, which is barely above sea level to this day, and there it is. 11 miles wide. It's now an atoll. Uh, it literally is a few, uh, only a couple of feet above sea level. Um, they actually have an incredible oral tradition, which I recently published, thanks to the last surviving wisdom keeper of the island who gave me permission to do so. So it's a wonderful privilege for me to be able to do this. Um, they talk about the Anunnaki believe it or not. So look at where you are. You're in the middle of nowhere. You're nowhere near Sumeria or Mesopotamia or in Egypt. And they're talking about these gods from the other side of the world. Because in this part of the world, they call them the Tuanake. And they say that they were sailing the Pacific 12,000 years ago and were still present here in the Cook Islands when it was much bigger in 3000 BC because they used to go here all the way back to Mesopotamia and back because they had wonderful ships. Uh, in fact, they're beautiful double hull catamarans that were still built this very day in Tonga and they are absolutely gorgeous and very seafaring. Now, 
The Tonga Raven people of the Cook Islands described the Tuanaki as great sages, star navigators, red-haired, fair-skinned, shining people who belong to a very ancient lineage of wisdom keepers. And of course, that got me very excited. I figured there's a book in here somewhere. Let me find out how these threads connect. And I was able to trace the origin of all these people back to the Anu, uh, which have basically resided in the highlands of Armenia, which is a very, very interesting place as I'm becoming to find out. And uh, the Anu once held a, uh, once lived on a compound on an island in the Metsamore River. Uh, which be essentially behaved like a big pregnant belly, exactly the same as you were finding at the beginning in, the, in uh, New Zealand. It's the primordial man, it's the man of the pregnant goddess. And on this river in the, uh, in the middle of uh, Armenia, you'll find one of the oldest cities and religious centers in the world. And believe it or not, to this very day, it's called Ani which is a variant of the name Anu. And Anu, as it always has been in Armenia, was a goddess who was golden-haired. In other words, she was blonde. And her name was An Anahit or Anu. So these names are interchangeable over time. They're just variations of the language. And thank God that now the Armenian tongue is beginning to become much more uh, uh, accessible in the West, because uh, even in America, there's only one... Uh, accessible English Armenian dictionary, which I've been working on. And it also turns out to be one of the oldest root languages in the world. And uh, this is the point where I want to sort of close the loop in this entire story, because we have to go back to the beginning uh, of uh, where we began, right here, boing, in Kudatauhiti, the birthplace of the gods. Because this is the one thing that really mesmerizes me about the way that our ancestors were getting around the world and uh, literally uh, without any problem uh, and how things are so interconnected and much more than we give them credit for in the academic circles. As I said before, uh, the Maori refer to this birthplace of the gods as the crucible, okay? Well, it turns out the, the word kura literally has exactly the same meaning and is spelt exactly the same way in ancient Armenian. And so is the rest of that word. So kura tahiti in, uh, to a person who is visiting from Armenian literally means the crucible of the goddess. Now, isn't that interesting then? The, the picture of what, I just, uh, the, what I'm standing and look where, that you're looking at behind me is that enormous stone, which is the goddess of this site. So here we are in the crucible of the goddess in New Zealand, which is named after an Armenian source with gods which are described exactly in the same way. Oh, I love my job, it's wonderful. So it demonstrates, I believe, how the ancient gods had the ability to travel on a global scale. Uh, and they were far more interconnected than we have give them credit for. And explains why we also have a history of megalithic sites that are exactly the same in shape, size and scale and building construction, whether you are in Easter Island, whether you're in Tahiti, in, um, let's see, Taiwan, Japan, the, uh, the Near East, uh, the Middle East, Armenia, Egypt, and I can go on for a long time here, people, and also, of course, Egypt. It's one global connected people. They are borrowing exactly from the same book. And many of these sites also appear to appear on the face of the earth around the same time that we have a major cataclysm called the end of the Ice Age. And then they are rebuilt by groups of gods who arrive in hotspots around the world in groups of seven led by a charismatic leader and ironically appear at the same time in these hot spots where humanity, where hunter gatherers miraculously discovered agriculture, animal husbandry, mathematics, the stars at exactly the same moment in time. So it's not by accident that, that uh, we suddenly were elevated from hunter gatherers to be almost godlike in our appearance because we were given the, the information by people who already had been there. They had done that. They got the T-shirt, and they also, a few of them survived, just like humans, to retell the story and to restart the civilization to human beings. 
And here we are today. So even though today, you know, here we are going around the world with masks, being vaccinated, with all of this encumbrance. Well, just remember that there's a good lining to this story because back then, look at what these people had to put up with. They had to put up with uh, tidal waves that were three miles high because they crossed right into Tibet. These put, people put up with meteorites that destroying the earth, massive fires, and the, I'd say probably the loss of nine tenths of the, the uh, whole population of the earth. We have nothing to complain about because we are basically the progenitors of this culture. And this is why it's so important to understand where we come from and how we inherited this culture, because we are the gods we've been looking for. We are the maintainers of this culture. And it's up to us now to promulgate this incredible story so that the people on the next level of uh, evolution, which is where we're right at right now, they don't forget this story and they take it to their children and their grandchildren. And this is how we maintain society perpetuating itself forever and ever and ever. I got bad news for you people. We're not going anywhere. The human race is here to stay. We just change and uh, we adapt and we keep on going. And as the song says, don't worry, be happy. So as for the other 370 pages of this incredible story, I've got a book and a DVD for you. And uh, it's, uh, believe me, it's going to alter things in a very, very dramatic way for you. So thank you very much for uh, your patience and uh, your, uh, your time today. Uh, can we get this back on? Uh, oh, here we are. Oh, technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, so hopefully it's been of use to show you where we've come from and where we're going. At Freddie, thank you so much. Absolutely. As you were talking, that's you you said the words I was thinking regarding the importance of understanding where we've been, the interconnectedness of all. There's obviously a very conscious design, you know, bringing us all together. There's and a big plan. There's a big plan. And and to me, you know, that points to the the real importance of how we walk in the world and the reverence and the the respect that we give the earth and all of the sites and all of the, the kingdoms that are Absolutely. Here. So um, thank you. Thank you for taking it to, to that even further back in that another wide view for us. That was, that was fascinating. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks to you and Neil for having me and for putting this on. Got to get you, this brother. information out there. Got to keep it going. Definitely, man. As always, your research is so incredible, brother. Thank you for everything you do. Just, um, I'm just excited for everything that you release in the future and what you're going to keep doing. Oh, I'm working on something very juicy right now. I can't wait. I can't. I just finished it today, actually, and it's going to be very interesting. Okay, now I need to know. Are you going to tell us? or? <laughs> it's about Scotland. It's about my fascination with the origin of these sites in Scotland. In fact, I kind of let the, yeah. the cat out of the bag about uh, a few months ago because, you know, we're all stuck at home. I found myself with tens of thousands of hours of footage that I've, fit, I've shot around the world. And I've done, I think, three or four documentaries, uh, which are now on my website. And, uh, and I thought, well, I can't wait to write a book. I'm going to put this out. And uh, I was curious about where the origin of the sites of Scotland come from, because they don't belong there. They don't belong in Britain. And the more you ask, the more you keep pushing the envelope. And it was because of a, a, something that happened when I went to Sardinia with Regina Meredith uh, of Gaia, who I'm about to go and see in a couple of days, actually. We're going to film another episode. Uh, something happened there that suddenly the world just opened like this. I went, oh, and I'm not going to say an expletive on there because that's what I said. It was like, <laughs> because I could not believe that suddenly I'm in another part of the world and it suddenly explains Scotland. So, and it's going to get interesting after this. And believe me, I had no idea where it was going to go. And I had to learn a dead language to, in order to figure this out. And I've had a lot of friends in Armenia, I'll give you a clue, to help me out on this. And uh, yeah, it's, this is why I like my job, because there's no, there's no pattern. There's no set road. You just follow the crumbs and these little bits of information. And you have no idea if you're going to be wasting your time. You just kind of follow along and see where it goes. And this time it's going to be a home run. So yeah. So hopefully by the end of the year, there'll be uh, something, uh, a nice big thick 50,000 word book on the horizon. Oh, so we'll wow. see. 
So Freddie, just real quick, there is a, there are a couple questions. Um, I just want to let you give your heads up. I'm going to be reaching out to you. So watch your email for me. Cause if, <laughs> so you answer, cause if not, I'm going to have Neil reach out for me. Um, cause I definitely just want to talk to you further, but there's questions regarding your website and upcoming trip. So if you can just, um, ah, promotion, yes. publicity. Very important. Yes, in about six weeks, uh, we are going, a group of willing infidels, because I do a lot of information, so we're not infidels, we're infodels. Uh, we're going to Peru and Lake Titicaca, and it's all planned, it's all going ahead. Six weeks, and we have three places left. Small group of people, as I try to keep it small and personal, and my good colleague, Edgar Mejita, who is a wonderful, and he's a real Aymara, He's the real thing. He's a shaman. So while I talk, he does the ceremony. And between the two of us, it's a lovely relationship. And I love it. And here's the best part. You get to chew coca leaf legally for 10 days. Because without it, you can't breathe. Uh, you, the blood will just boom, uh, and you will literally drown in your own blood. Um, so you have to chew coca leaf and drink lots of water to basically you know, keep the oxygen going. And that's a great thing. So we all look like we're a bit spaced out, but that's part of the thing because everybody does it there as well. So if uh, if that wasn't enough of a draw, <laughs> now you know. Uh, and we do have a lot of good fun. And we've got Egypt coming up after that week after that. I think there's one place left. Um, there's 320 people on the waiting list for that trip because we have way too much fun in Egypt. I mean, we really do have great fun. We have a lot of friends out there. So uh, yeah, just check the website at invisibletemple.com and see what's happening and uh, come and join us. Invisibletemple.com. So for everyone in the chat and uh, ready. Yeah, thank you. Are you able to come back for the Q&A panel? We're going to start that shortly. Or... I've split. Yeah, I've got a split. Okay. Unfortunately, but uh, I'll be there in spirit. I'll, I'll, I'll put the answers into people's heads. We'll, we'll, we'll communicate. <laughs> We're also re re we'll be reeling off the frequency of the information you just shared too. Like, <laughs> you connected so many dots right there for me. I, just, I actually wrote notes because just like connecting oh. the dots from all these different places in the world. So as always, brother, thank you so much. We'll be in touch soon. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Exciting.